Good evening, and welcome to tonight's Combined Neighborhood Watch Meeting and Amazing Citizen Award. Uh, it has been a very long time since we've been back at the police department for one of our uh, joint neighborhood watch meetings. Um, it's been crazy uh, the last year and few months. Um, but before we get started, I want to uh, recognize some of our special guests here uh, tonight. Um, we have, uh, it would be my first time introducing him as Mayor Frank Reeves is in attendance. <laughs> um, town Manager Chris Ively is also here. Um, and some of our new council members, um, Mr. Short, um, Mr. Kalinga, he's in the back. Um, who do we else? Uh, Ms. Schmidt. Um, and then we have Ms. Taylor, who's always here <laughs> representing us. <laughs> um, and then we also have uh, from the Board of Supervisors, uh, Mr. David Durr um, is also here with us. Um, so for tonight, we have an amazing program with an amazing uh, citizen. And right now, we'll turn it over to a video of what makes our person so amazing. Welcome to Culpeper, a town and county unlike any other. Pastoral views, a vibrant downtown, where destinations and activities abound. There is one aspect in particular that helps Culpeper rise above the rest, the people. Every day, all over the community, people are working to make a difference. I think of an amazing citizen as someone who gives back to their community. Someone that, to me, serves their community, not wanting anything in return. They are willing to do whatever it takes to keep things organized and keep people happy and to help people. The thing that stands out to me most about Ann is that she's just always ready to volunteer. Doesn't matter what is asked of her, she's ready to do it. And she will sometimes just come up with something on her own. If nobody needs help, she will find somebody that needs help. If you've ever heard the expression, oh, take the bull by the horns and run, well, that was Ann. If you give her a task, she would do it. And she would do it to the utmost. And, uh, it was always to perfection. Anne just doesn't have her hand in one thing and giving back to Culpepper, but lots of areas. And so she knows so many people and she's so dedicated to every job that she takes on. I've primarily worked with her through Lions Club. We work bingo on Sunday nights together. And, and I, I can't, the number of projects and events that we've done has been Tremendous. I work with her with bingo. She and I alternate Sundays. She opens her house to um, things that we do for raising funds. It's never a question, oh no, you know, oh no, I, I can do it. We can do it at my house. She never says no. Right now, she is just our membership chair of our, uh, of our club, which is Culpeper 92. She has been our zone chair for the entire district. She's been president of our club. And if I had a few minutes, I could probably think of a dozen other things that she's involved in with the Lions. <laughs> a lot of the things that she does, she doesn't advertise. Um, I never knew how many years, and she's been doing it for years, doing the baskets at Christmas time. And isn't just involved in the Lions 91, but she, or she is, has been in that for many years. They start preparing about October, having meetings to get ready for the Christmas baskets that they do every year. Well, Ann has been involved in that, I know, 25, 30 years and uh, they, they uh, get all of the food together, you know, and then they go down to the Brandy Firehouse and assemble it, and it takes her, her, her and uh, Sue Jenkins to uh, do that, and she's been doing that for 20, 25 years, maybe longer. We organize the food drives at schools, at businesses around Culpeper. We organize um, getting, packing all the boxes and um, packing the toys and then reaching out to the families to have them come pick them up. I mean, there are hundreds of families that get fed because of it. It's not, not, not just a handful of people. I mean, there are hundreds of uh, families. that. Uh... And we have served as many as 500 families 
This year we were just under like um, probably about 375. There would be so many people that would not have been helped if it weren't for her. And that's, I guess that's it in a nutshell. We lost our home to a fire a number of years ago and um, every Christmas we had a gift exchange and we had, we'd have a Christmas party with our Lions Club and have a gift, ex gift exchange and you brought a gift and we always played some kind of game to you know decide who gets what gift. Well this year uh, it was our house burned in October and December. Um, we were living in a fully furnished apartment and we were soon to be moving into an unfurnished apartment and so we you know we were kind of hurting for items but we had no thoughts about that but we go to the party and we take our gift and when it comes time to start swapping gifts and explains that all the gifts are for us and I feel sure that Anne was behind that. She just has this love for Culpepper and the people here and that she that she helps them as much as she can. Could make me too. <laughs> She's selfless in what she's doing. And again, doesn't expect anything. She really cares about people. And she she helps. I mean, whatever needs to be done, she's there to help do it. Well, she's just, she's a leader. She's a, a good person and a person that you would want to be around and a person that you enjoy uh, having a conversation with. And I'd like to congratulate you on being an amazing citizen. Um, I know that you are an amazing person and you are an amazing citizen above that um, for Culpepper, and you are certainly um, deserving of this award. I think she's very deserving. I'm really happy for her. At this time, I would welcome <clears throat> Chief Jenkins to present the plaque and Major Settle for the presentation of gifts. Again, welcome everyone. Uh, it was it was John uh, Crawchuk, uh, Cup of Media, put that together. Did a great job. Thank you, John. <laughs> I, I like sitting in the back of the room, and I was watching Anne as everyone spoke, and I could just say that she's she just wants this to be over. She's, <laughs> <laughs> but we're not. <laughs> The, uh, the great part about doing the presentation it's here on, on the, uh, the video presentation is all of the, uh, I mean, I could say it and repeat every single thing that was just said, and it would be repeated. I mean, from Ari and Joan, every, everyone, just everyone just captured you to why we're here today. And I, I just, it's just an amazing person and you certainly are deserving of the Amazing Citizens Award. So by being our Amazing Citizens Award, a lot of our sponsors here on the board would like for everyone to sort of take note, um, have given deeply to appreciate all that you have done for our community, and So it is time now that we ask you to join Major Settle here and myself up front. And uh, it is with great honor that we present Ann Laster with our Amazing Citizen Award. In recognition of your endless efforts, dedication to community outreach and involvement, the Culpeper Police Department and the community we serve appreciates your dedication and unconditional support. Your commitment to community service truly epitomizes what makes you an amazing citizen. Congratulations on this outstanding accomplishment. Presented February of 2022. Again, I would sort of take you uh, to our uh, sponsors and uh, Major Settle for some reason always likes us to start with Green Roost. Um, <laughs> 
I'm, I'm not sure why, but uh, on behalf of Green Roost, we have. And I must tell you, I, I grew up in Culpeper, and the one place that has stayed the same, my favorite, Ganackles Bakery. I would recommend the triple layer coconut cake. <laughs> Poker rolls are good. Uh, then another one of my favorites right on Main Street. Uh, in the old State Theater building is Moving Meadows Farms. And if you haven't tried their cinnamon buns, where's Eric Kalinga at? I think he's tried every single thing they have. <laughs> now he's hiding back here, he won't admit it, but he's tried every single thing. Best cheeseburger in Culpeper, please. If it's not, Chris Settle will pay for it. So, so while in Moving Meadows, it's presented and with a gift certificate, Moving Meadows. So enjoy that. Another gym in that little town right on Main Street that is uh, Shenandoah Garden uh, spot where the sun is always shining. We have presented this bouquet of flowers, and I guess we're presenting that twice by now. And we also, right there on David Street, it's about time. If you uh, have a, if you have a hard time finding someone to go, usually daytime we're very available. <laughs> They're closed on Monday, I believe, but uh, on the other day. So it's about time. It's presenting Anne with lunch for two. It's about time. I'm your friend, Anne. And she paid me for lunch. We got issues now. <laughs> We don't, we don't have those issues in the police department, okay? <laughs> so, uh, and just, uh, just to echo uh, all that you do in our community, very unselfish that you're giving of yourself. Uh, anyone that's ever volunteered for anything in our community has ran into Ann last year at some place, sometime. And um, as uncomfortable as this makes you feel, that means we got the right person. <laughs> so we... We, we're very appreciative and a very grateful community. We take this moment just to say thank you. For someone asked how long I think you asked me down Brandy a couple weeks. How long? How long does this last? You amazing citizen, forever, ever, and ever. So, yeah. So we have a, a special, special presentation here tonight. Yeah, all the all the way from all the way from Washington, I believe. Yeah. yeah. I'm gonna leave. No, you stay up here. So as the Chiefs probably regressed, uh, we probably didn't fail to mention for people new to this concept is the Chief uh, assembles the committee and we get nominations from the public and uh, uh, Ann was an overwhelming unanimous choice for this ward. Uh, the day I called her to inform her of this ward, she says, no, give it to somebody else. And usually what Ann says, you do. I mean, when she gives you an order, you do it. But this is one order I probably didn't follow because she bosses all around Bingo all the time. So. So without further ado, we do have a special representative here today, representing uh, our representative Abigail Spanberger. Uh, Ms. Spanberger heard about this uh, award tonight and wanted to send a representative from her office, Mark uh, Rebordum. Uh, he's their community outreach person, and he has a special presentation for Ann as well. Good evening. Uh, I'm Mark Rebordum from Congresswoman Spanberger's office. Uh, she regrets she couldn't attend, but I wanted to make sure that I was here to hand deliver this letter of recognition. Um, so I'll go ahead and read this letter and then I'll present it to her. Dear Ms. Laster, as the U.S. Representative for Virginia's 7th Congressional District, it is my true pleasure to offer you my congratulations on being awarded the Culpeper Police Department's Amazing Citizen Award. The Amazing Citizen Award recognizes individuals in your community who go above and beyond in making Culpeper a better place. For decades, You've served the community through your volunteer work with the annual Culpeper Christmas Basket, the Culpeper County Volunteer Fire Department's Ladies Auxiliary, 
and the Culpeper 92 Lions. You have helped make possible countless events such as bingos, banquets, and fundraisers for these organizations and other groups. Beyond these formal volunteer roles, you have always been ready to lend a helping hand to your neighbors by providing transportation to medical appointments and grocery store trips, and to brighten someone's day with a homemade treat. It is clear that your countless acts of kindness and service to your community over the past 50 years in Culpeper merit nothing less than an honor such as this. It is my pleasure to congratulate you on this well-deserved recognition. Thank you again for your dedication to your neighbors and community. Your acts of kindness and selflessness are inspiring, and they have not gone unnoticed. I am pleased to join with our community in recognizing you for this award, and I look forward to future opportunities to thank you for your service to the Culpeper community. Sincerely, Abigail Spamberger, Member of Congress. Not really. This is a little embarrassing, really. <laughs> but I appreciate it. And there's so many other people in Culpeper that's more deserving. As you can see, I'm getting. <laughs> but I thank everyone for all the kind things that you said. And just hope the good Lord lets me stay on my feet so I can continue volunteering and doing what I love. I really appreciate this. Um, at this time, we'll take a short intermission uh, and um, we'll get back to our program with our uh, uh, guest speaker. All right, thank you. Okay, uh, welcome back uh, to the second part of the program. Um, before we do the uh, guest speaker, we will have. Are you doing it? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> we'll have a... <laughs> Captain Chilton uh, introduce one of our new officers. So I guess this is the big part where, since a police agency that's full for a change, we're we're actually that speaks volumes of the you know the town. <laughs> we, we have a full staff, which means this young man just got out of the academy. He's one of our newest ones, and he came to us from, he went to middle school here, went to high school here, went up through our Explorer program. As he came up through our Explorer program, then he went to uh, work at CVRJ, which was actually a regional jail for a little bit. And once he uh, got there and Chief Jenkins decided he was going to keep picking him, pulling him, pulling him, pulling him, pulling him, he finally gave in and came to work for us. So he's, uh, he's been here a few months now. <laughs> He, he's just back there telling everybody, the only thing you can do when you get on the podium, you have to say one good thing about the chief before you start. The middle, you can say whatever you want. And at the end, you have to say something good about the chief again. So, you know, so. anyway, this is Remy Judd, Nicholas Remy Judd, and he's one of our newest folks. And he, uh, we have one more guy. He's out on maternity leave right now. But other than that, this is, this is Remy. And he's, it's his stage for a second. Hi, folks. Doing tonight. Um, thank you, Captain. Thank you, Chief. Um, like you said, I'm Officer Judd. Um, it's always been a dream to work for a community um, like Culpeper. Lived here, grew up here, love the people here. I mean, I did Explorers for six years with the department. No department I'd rather be with than here because they have a amazing community relationship, um, which I think is a big thing for the police department, is the aspect that the, part the department has with the community. And the things that they do with the community, the outreach that they do with the community is amazing. And I'm proud to be here at this agency. Um, I appreciate the chief and everybody else giving me the opportunity to be here. And I hope I can live up to the corporate police name and do a good job here. Thank you. Um, so our guest speaker is 
uh, Deputy Chief with the Copper River Volunteer Fire Department, uh, Charles Jr. Perryman. Uh, Mr. Perryman will be giving a presentation on the different aspects of the uh, Volunteer Fire Department along with fire safety. Chief Jenkins, thanks for having me. This better? Okay. Thanks for having me here. I'm here to talk a little bit about the uh, Culpeper Fire Department, but I thought I'd also take the opportunity to talk about the volunteer system in Culpeper as a whole. There's more than just Culpeper. There are seven other fire departments in EMS, rescue squads in Culpeper, and together we work uh, in the entire community, community for both fire and EMS emergencies. That's our logo on the left. I guess that's hard to not guess what that one is. And this is the uh, Fire and Rescue Association. So as they mentioned, my name's Charles, but everybody knows me as Junior. Uh, last name's Perryman. Uh, I grew up in Culpeper, born and raised. Uh, I started back in 1983 um, volunteering with Salem Fire Department and um, received lots of training. Uh, I had I moved into Culpeper and I couldn't see passing a firehouse to get to a firehouse, so I joined Culpeper Fire Department. Uh, that was hard to do after 25 plus years at Salem, but we made the change and they welcomed me with open arms, which was great. And um, I've been there for 14 years now. So um, my day job, I do work at Swift here in Culpeper. I've been there almost as long. I've been at Swift. Uh, 36 years, almost 37. So it's uh, it's great to be able to live in Culpeper, work in Cul and uh, work in Culpeper. Um, again, great community. I enjoy volunteering, and we've got a bunch of great volunteers in Culpeper. Assisting me tonight is uh, our assistant chief, Joe Weeks. Joe uh, is a career firefighter in Arlington. Um, he will tell you a little bit more about himself. But again, another great thing is that we have career firefighters and EMS that work outside Culpeper and they live in Culpeper so they come back and volunteer here. So that allows us to get some outside um, training, but also they see a lot more than we do in Culpeper. We run a lot of calls, but as you can imagine, Arlington has everything. So it's great to get that and, and Joe's a great instructor and he'll tell you a little bit more about himself when uh, he comes up. All right, so we are, uh, did the introduction, and we'll go through. I'll talk a little bit about the volunteers in action, um, talk about Culpepper and the seven supporting companies, a little bit about our demographics. I'm, as the president of the Fire and Rescue Association, I, I, I'm really looking to see how we can maintain the volunteers. If the volunteers would go away, you're looking about $35, $36 million a year in taxes uh, to staff all the stations, uh, and to keep them up and running 24-7. So that's the value we're adding. We're saving the community lots of money, and we're doing it because we love to do it. Training up, um, the training efforts and the apparatus costs, I, again, I think it's good to see that not only are we answering calls and doing the training, we're also carrying mortgages for our firehouses. We're paying for the fire trucks uh, with, through fundraising. So you'll see some of that. And then Joe's going to wrap it up with fire safety. So answering calls, before we can answer the calls, we have to fundraise. We need to be able to purchase new vehicles, purchase new buildings, pay those mortgage payments. Our members are kind of the center of everything. They're very, very important. And then of course we have to receive the training in order to do the right thing out in the field. And just to share is that as volunteers, our training is exactly as what the career staff get around the state, around the nation. It's no different, and we'll talk a little bit about that. 
And with that, we couldn't do all this without the community support. Uh, we have uh, lots of fundraisers, uh, and without you all to come and, and support us, we wouldn't have the monies to do what we do. Recruitment and retention is a big thing. Uh, people like me who are starting to get a little older, I can still do the job, but it's a little harder the next day when I get to get up out of bed. It's just, it's, 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 it's very stressful and very uh, strenuous work. And the leadership. I think we have great leadership in our fire and rescue organizations. Um, it's, it's, we've got all types of walks of life, uh, business leaders, uh, government workers, um, you name it, it's out there. And we rely on all those skill sets to keep us going. So now we'll talk a little bit about all the organizations. And, and what I'm sharing here is, if you don't know, um, like I said, there's eight fire departments and seven rescue squads, six rescue squads in the community and one first responder. So Culpeper Fire Department is in town. And we have a specialty piece. We uh, have the only aerial ladder truck in town or in the county. Brandy Station has a specialty piece. They use a gator, uh, being more out in the rural area, hunting accidents, where farms where they have to get to patients, they're able to use the gator to get to the, to the uh, injured people. And they also uh, run an ice rescue. Um, we actually, they were dispatched this year. Fortunately, it wasn't a person. It was a dog trapped out on the ice, and they were there to, to assist. Richardsville, being on the river, uh, they have a boat water rescue team. Salem Fire and Rescue, they have a canteen. Uh, sometimes we're out for hours at a time, so it's always nice to have refreshments and hot coffee and water, those types of things, so we can ask for them to come to us. Little Fork, um, you may have seen a lot of publicity around their animal rescue. It's the only one in the state. Uh, they do go around and help get cows out of creeks or out of the mud. Uh, horses that get down in stalls are able to help them up. So they do, they're very um, successful with that animal rescue. Rapidan uh, has a specialty piece. Uh, it's a light and air unit, and the lights, of course, are helpful at nighttime, and they have all types of lights that help us light up the scene. And on their rig, they have a cascade system which refills our air bottles. So that's a big help to us when we're out for long periods of time. Culpeper Rescue, they don't have a, a specialty piece right now, and one of the main reasons is their call volume is so high. It's, it's, it's just difficult to specialize in something. They're, they're constantly on the road running rescue calls, ambulance calls. And then Reva, um, they have a specialty piece as well. They have a MCI mass casualty uh, incident trailer. So if there's a bus overturned or a plane down or Whatever catastrophe that could hit Culpeper, we would rely on them to bring that. It has backboards and neck collars and all kinds of supplies to help get patients moved. So volunteering, we've never stopped. And I just wanted to share last year we had an increase in fire calls. We were up 17% last year, over 2,000 fire calls. And on the EMS side, over 6,200 calls. And this is all volunteer effort. And we also enjoy working with the town police uh, with their uh, national night out. This was just a couple years ago um, where all the volunteers came into the town or into the neighborhoods and we showed our equipment, um, helped land a helicopter. We have to be there when, when air care or whatever helicopter comes in. As you can see, the children really uh, enjoy um, going through the vehicles. And we also do, during Fire Prevention Week, I think we visit, or we have about over 800 children that we see and we talk about fire and EMS and what to do and what not to do. Uh, and they, from three years old to maybe 10 years old. So it's, uh, that's a very successful program that we do. This place may look familiar. This is a recent incident. This was um, the Mexican restaurant on the south end of town. There you can see our, our ladder truck flowing water on top of the fire. Um, 
The canteen that we have at Salem is out of service right now. There's a church in Falkir County that will come to any, go, will go anywhere to assist. And when they brought tables and chairs, they even brought a porta john. Uh, they brought hot coffee. They brought food. They baked pancakes out there. So it was really a treat to, to be able to, to be able to do that. A little bit about the demographics. Um, again, not to get too deep into the weeds, but you can see we have 568 volunteers in Culpeper County. Um, what I'm looking at is, is the demographics again on the age of our volunteers. Some of us are gonna be aging out. We need to get younger members in to pick up the, uh, the slack, right? So we're, looked, we're, we're planning for the future. We all know one day Culpeper will be all career. But before that happens, there is something called a combination department where you will have some career staff in the stations, but the volunteers will still be doing the bulk of the work. And then eventually, Culpepper will go all career. Um, and again, I'm just looking here. We, we took on 89 new members. So what concerns me here, or something that we need to deal with, do a deeper dive in, is that while we took in 89, we dropped to 568 from 590 the year before. Diversity, lots of uh, male and female. We're also getting more Latinos involved, which is a big help in our area, being a lot of Spanish-speaking uh, uh, members living in Culpeper. And I've already mentioned the career fire and EMS professional, professionals who are working outside our county as, as career professionals who are giving back to Culpeper. So before we get on a fire truck, we have to get a certain level of training. This training here that you see, the number of hours, again, is the same thing the career, career guys and women receive. So firefighter one is 160 hours. It takes about four months to go through that as a volunteer. Um, firefighter two is another level, 57 hours. In order to drive the trucks and ambulances, you need to be EVOC, Emergency Vehicle Operations Course Trained, at 16 hours, that's a weekend. There's a basic pump operator, which is 16 hours, means that you can get water on the truck and off the truck. Typically, your tanker drivers, your bus truck drivers will take that. Um, driver pumper operator, those are the ones who pull the levers on the truck to make sure that the water goes out the right hose, it's being pumped at the right pressure, and that they're getting enough water to sustain operations. Uh, driver aerial operator, in order to drive the ladder truck, that's another 56 hours, um, well, 40 hours plus the 16 hours for EVOC. Um, that's another level of certification that we have to have before we, are, we turn our drivers uh, loose. And then once you get all that, if you want to become an instructor to teach any of these classes above, you go through an instructor series. There's an instructor one, instructor two, instructor three. Um, but you can see the amount of hours there. And then if you want to be an officer, there's an officer one, two, three, and I think there's a four that's coming out. Officer one is the most hours, and that's 72 hours. Again, all volunteers are going through this. We're not getting paid. It's our weekends. It's our nights. Um, so these are all the things that we do before, the, before we even get on the truck. Um, EMS is the same. Uh, they also have to go through an EVOC course. There's something called hazmat awareness, uh, which is a little bit less than the operations. It's like, like it says, more of an awareness of what to do when someone's exposed to some nasty chemicals. Uh, the EMT class, 154 hours. On top of that, we have shock trauma techs, and then on top of that, we have paramedics. Um, and to be a paramedic, it's almost, well, it's a little bit more than two semesters or an associate's degree. I will say here, since we're talking about EMS, we are all volunteer except for the career staff in Culpeper. The career staff are EMS mostly, they are trained, some are, I think most are all are trained in firefighting, the basic level of fire one. Um, they do help support us. Uh, typically the ambulance gets to the scene before we do. 
and they can be radioing saying, hey, you have a hydrant here, we're seeing this, um, come down this driveway, those kind of things which help us out. Uh, and they're also there for us to take care of us uh, in case we're injured. And there's three, three ambulances that are up 24 seven that are around the clock. And the Fire and Rescue Association actually asked for the career staff and I'm, I'm trying to remember how far back it was, but it was about 20 years ago because back then, the EMS, the volunteers were being overrun by the number of calls in. We just could not answer all the calls. Well, we could answer them, but it just took longer. We needed to get uh, EMS services to those who needed it quicker and sooner. So I just want to touch a little bit. This is a, one of our training facilities. This one's loaded, uh, located in Orange County. It's called a burn building. Um, that one there on the left, top left, it's, it's three, three floors. We consider it a basement, first floor, second floor. Um, the picture on the right are all volunteer recruits that are going through the training to get their firefighter one. We go inside and we actually set fires inside. It's a concrete building. Uh, it's a controlled environment. There's temperature sensors that if it gets too hot above a thousand degrees we start cutting the fire back a little bit because the idea is these are all new recruits we want to be sure that they don't get um, uh, scared not scared but injured and uh, in, in such a in their first days of going inside a burning building the one on the lower right is a simulator door simulator so of course the doors typically are, typically are not open or they may not be open. So we have to force a door. This is a prop that we actually can put a wooden dowel in it. So you have to force the door with the tools just like you were going into our home. And then they're advancing a hose line or attack line into the first floor of the structure. We throw ladders to all four sides for means of egress for us in case we have to bail out a window, but it also in case we find a trapped victim inside, it allows us to get the victim out quickly. As you can see here, we're lowering, lowering a victim. And we also practice going to the roof, as you can see there. And then I've also added that, you know, after every incident, there's always something different. There's a little bit of twist on what we do, depending on the call. And we always ask ourselves, ask ourselves did we do the right thing? Did we learn anything? And is everybody okay? Because we want everybody to go home to their families at the end of the day. So when you look at the costs of our fire trucks and the replacement cycle, um, these are like your Tahoes that are outfitted with lights and radios and command boxes and things like that. They run about 90,000. Brush trucks, 200. Ambulance and medic units, about 300,000. Just your plain fire truck is 750,000. Our rescue engines are typically the ones that carry the extrication equipment, shoring, uh, which if we have a, a structure collapse or something like that, we're able to shore things up so that we can get access to patients. Uh, tankers, 500,000. Aerial trucks, 1.2 million. And Culpepper's fire truck, the one we replaced, was 37 years old. They were supposed to be replaced at 20 years. So we got our life out of that. Fortunately, we got together, we wrote up a grant, a federal grant, and we received $960,000 of tax money that came back to Culpepper that helped us pay for that fire truck, for that ladder truck. Light and air unit we've talked about, 300 command vehicles, utilities, gators, boats and these are what we have in our long-range plan as far as replacement this is our replacement cycle um, again some don't get replaced on what NFPA says we should replace them at the intervals just because we can't afford them we are all I will say that I, I get to travel around a bit around the state with fire and EMS with mostly with fire uh, teaching and testing uh, I didn't say I am a part-time state adjunct instructor as well, uh, which allows me to go test both volunteer and career um, firefighters. Um, 
Culpeper is blessed to have the equipment that we have. We have some of the best equipment in the community or around. And I think that goes back to us being volunteers and we know how hard it is to work for that equipment. So we take really good care of it. And we are in the process of replacing one of our engines, which is in excess of 20 years old. And we've already been told by the industry that expect a 12% increase this year because of supply materials. COVID has really put a hurt on the volunteers. Um, you can see where our fundraising um, monies come from. Um, I've listed, there, listed them there on the right. Uh, so in 2020, we lost about $800,000 that we generated to help ourselves to buy new equipment. And then again, last year, we were able to do a little bit of fundraising, but still seven, $800,000. So in two years, we've lost $1.6 million in funds that we, that we actually raised. And because of COVID, the fire service is um, very rigid, a um, lot of tradition on what we do. Um, we typically met in person. Uh, we learned how to go and do virtual meetings. We uh, were able to use Zoom a lot for some of our county meetings. We're trying to get out and let everybody know we're still here. With Culpeper Fest, the career fairs, we've got brochures out. A lot of the departments have their own media, social media network. Um, we're drumming up uh, new recruits. Um, WJMA has been good to us with uh, public service announcements. We uh, are working on getting some banners up for Fire Prevention Week, EMS Week, to let everybody know that we're volunteers and we're still working. Um, the chamber has been very good to us as well. They've done a couple appreciation banquets for all that we do. And we're working on getting some of these volunteer roadside signs to let people coming into Culpeper know that this is an all volunteer um, community. And Culpeper Times, Culpeper Times too, we've been not partnering, but they've been very uh, generous and, and working with us to put together uh, articles. Um, we try to get two articles out every quarter um, to tell the community about what we're doing. And again, uh, the fire departments in days past were like the hub of the local villages and the communities. And people would come for bingo, people would come for spaghetti dinners, pancake suppers, those types of things. And last two years, you know, it was a big change. Uh, we couldn't do that because of social distancing. So we said, well, what about a drive through chicken dinner? You know, who, who would have thought? Spaghetti dinners, uh, we've done more raffles. Uh, Salem does a drive-in movie outside in their large parking lot. Um, Culpepper, who's 98 years old, our fire department, uh, we did our first fundraiser, letter fundraiser, uh, mail out this year. Uh, we're working on grants. We're, we're trying to grab some money from the CARES Act. We do boot drives out in the county. Um, some uh, up in the northern part of the county, uh, they've done some trail rides and did some standbys and they put a boot out and those who are there usually uh, put a little money in there. And we even try some of this online shopping. I, I'm not too familiar with it, but when you make a purchase, a very small proceed goes back to the department that is being sponsored. So that's my spiel on the volunteers in Culpeper. Um, again, it's more of an awareness of what we do and who we are. 24-7, um, we're answering calls um, because we want to. So with that, if no questions, I'll turn it over to Assistant Chief Joe Weeks from Culpeper Fire Department. I'd be remiss if I didn't say that. And that is an accomplishment. And we thank you for all you've done to get us here. So, all right, I'll turn it over to Joe. Sorry, but I just have to say it. Thank you. 
Hello, everybody. So to start with, when uh, Chief Perryman asked me to come out and uh, do a little uh, fire safety speech for a neighborhood watch meeting, I had no idea it was going to entail what we have here this evening. And I don't know how I'm supposed to follow uh, the, the award that Ann got, but congratulations to you. Um, so as uh, Chief Perryman introduced myself earlier, uh, my name is Joe Weeks. I'm the Assistant Chief here with the Culpeper Volunteer Fire Department. And I'm also a career firefighter with Arlington County. I've only been fortunate enough to be a resident here of Culpeper for the past eight years. I come here from Michigan. Uh, lived in Michigan for all my life and was in the fire service there for 16 years before coming down here to take the job in Arlington. Looked around the area and uh, I gotta tell you this uh, little town is exactly very similar to the town that uh, that I grew up in, and it uh, it feels like home, even though I've only been here for eight years. So, thank you very much for letting me come out here and and uh, give you guys a little talk about uh, fire safety. So, with this, Chief Perryman made this up for, for me here. So, bear with me; I am not the most technically advanced individual. So, what are we going to talk about? Home safety, home fire safety. So. Besides just fires, we talk about home safety in general because there's also a lot of injuries that happen in the home, right? More serious injuries happen in our homes than in workplaces. And that's largely due to agencies like OSHA and stuff like that have a lot of rules and regulations to help keep us safe at work. But when we get home, we kind of let our guard down and we think we're safe and we don't really think about some of those dangers associated. Smoke detectors, every home should have smoke detectors. We see this all the time and all of us are probably guilty at one point or another of not changing out our, our batteries and our smoke detectors or you know, maybe hearing it chirp or uh, I'm not gonna lie in my house occasionally when I've had to cook, uh, my family knows that when the, uh, the smoke detector goes off, the dinner's ready. So, uh, so sometimes that had been removed uh, you know, from the near the kitchen locations. So near the kitchen isn't always necessarily the best place to put those things for that reason because inevitably we're going to forget to stick that battery back in. Uh, but we should have them on uh, every level of the home, uh, also in bedrooms if possible. Our smoke detectors uh, that we put up, if you have a, a battery backup uh, system where it's powered through the house and they're all tethered together, the, you have to change out that battery once a year. We tell everybody every six months all the time because, again, we're all guilty of not always replacing those. So uh, we try to get everybody on that schedule of when we change our clocks in the spring and in the fall to go ahead and change those batteries out as well. We can take those batteries out, give them to our kids, our grandkids for toys and stuff like that. Uh, they might still have some juice, but to rely on those when, when we're asleep, probably not the, the best, most efficient thing for us to do. If you have uh, some of the newer ones uh, that have an integrated, like a battery that's sealed inside of them. You don't have to change those. Those are good for the life of the detector. But in all cases, smoke detectors should be changed every 10 years. Reason being, technology fades, right? So uh, I know that uh, from how old I am now at uh, 42 years old to 10 years ago, I already, over 10 years time, get up a little slower out of bed so I'm sure that uh, technology is no different and those smoke detectors respond a little bit slower than what they used to. So in, in today's fires, we really need to give ourselves every possible chance that we can and every second that we can. So if they're older than 10 years, we need to get those replaced. Speaking of fire moving faster, fire today versus 30, 40, 50 years ago grows at an exponentially faster rate uh, than what we were used to. That's been an issue not only for us in the fire service adjusting that, but for civilians in their homes as well. So it says fire grows uh, about three times faster th than it used to. Uh, back 20, 30 years ago, you used to have uh, about 17 minutes to escape your home before an event of something called flashover occurred. Flashover is when the entire room uh, is engulfed in flames from floor to, floor to ceiling we now only have a matter of minutes before that occurs. Not to mention only the faster, the fire is growing faster, smoke production is 800 times more than it was 30 and 40 years ago. That's largely due to the plastics and stuff that we have in all of our furnishings, 
uh, man-made materials. We have less uh, um, natural fibers, cottons, and stuff like that, and old furnitures and stuff like that. Even if you have an older home, if you've replaced your furniture, you still have these hazards associated with that. So not just the fire itself, the smoke is also a big problem for us as well. And these detectors will help us notify us faster so we can make sure that we give time to get out. We don't have the long time that we used to have. You guys don't have the long time that you used to have. Chief, I don't know if you have it later on or not, but I think now's a good time to mention about uh, sleeping with doors closed. For this reason, with this fire traveling faster and with smoke traveling, growing at a, at a much larger rate than it used to, sleeping with doors closed is going to provide you with many, many more minutes worth of time to allow us to get to you or, or for you to have the opportunity to get out. So if you're used to sleeping with doors open, I, I really encourage you sleep with those bedroom doors closed. It can provide you with a lot of opportunity, a lot of time. Don't forget to test our smoke detectors. That's something that we don't think about a lot either is we should be testing those smoke detectors monthly too. Uh, don't test them like I do by cooking, right? We wanna make sure we maybe try to push that button. Uh, you can test it with a broom handle or a cane, right? We don't always have to get up on top of things. We can use extenders to help reach those things. And make sure that it's loud enough uh, to wake you, right? Uh, if we do have uh, family members or ourselves that do have difficulties uh, hearing and stuff like that, they also make ones that have uh, like pulses and flashes and stuff like that too. So there's other opportunities out there. Uh oh, <laughs> besides the standard ones that we're used to. So as help an older person stay safe at home, make sure the smoke detectors work and they will wake people up when they're sleeping. We talked about the vibration and the strobe ones that I was just talking about. Test them once a month and replace after 10 years. Home escape plans. Home escape plans are something that uh, we used to push really hard in the fire service uh, a few years ago that has kind of gone off a little bit. We've gone more into the smoke detectors and closing the doors. Uh, but it's still a message that needs to be remembered of being able to have a plan. Uh, part of what we'll do when we arrive is try to find somebody that, that is either there with the home and give us some type of indication. Are there people inside? Do you have everybody accounted for? And if you don't know that information, it puts us in the position where we have to go in there uh, a little sooner, maybe without a hose line, without the protection that we have in order to try to, to, to get people out. So don't, don't stop, get out, right? Anything that's left in there is replaceable. And if it's not, let us get it for you. Again, because of that time, that speed that things are going faster, don't, don't worry about it. We'll, we'll get it for you. By all means, if your clothing catches fire, the stop, drop, and roll is still appropriate as well, right? Uh, something that I like to teach kids these days too is to cover their face and mouth so that when they're rolling around, they don't get any of that in their face. They don't get any of it in their lungs. And don't open the door. If, if our door is closed, sleeping like, we, like I just preached, and the smoke alarms go off, the very first thing you shouldn't do is just pop that door wide open. You pop that door wide open, all that smoke that I just talked about can come in there. One breath be enough to, to drop you, right? Call 911 from outside the home. Don't stop at your home to call one, right? Don't, don't look around for your cell phone. We have neighbors. No two ways out. Uh, a lot of the victims that we find, we find in uh, hallways leading towards the door that they're used to going in and out all the time. And that might not be the, the fastest way for them to get out. Sometimes they pass doors if they don't go through the front door and they're always going through the garage. We're going to find them in that path and they will have passed a door trying to get out. And then go to a predefined meeting place. So. Uh, especially with kids or anything like that, have a pre-designed meeting place, the mailbox, the tree out front, even better yet, maybe the neighbor's house. Uh, we think about like being in the front yard by the, the mailboxes. As we're arriving, we're gonna be coming through that area, we'll be stretching and ladders and this from that area is good too. Let us know if there's pets inside, let us know if there's people inside. All the information that we can get is only gonna better help us do our jobs. 
don't open any windows, and when you leave, close your door. If you're able to go out the, the door, uh, out the front door, close that door back up. It's going to, the, the fire breathes just like we do. So if we could cut that oxygen off and let it kind of build itself, burn itself out, it's going to save more of your belongings. It's gonna give more time for anybody else that might still be inside. If you need to use a wheelchair or cane, make sure you can get to them quickly so we don't want to keep them all the way on the other side of the room where somebody has to get them for us. Make fire escape plan that tells what each person will do when they get out. So if we have people that sleep in different rooms, we need to make sure that we have a different plan for each person and that we all know that. I do that with my kids. If I, if I wake up to a fire in the middle of the night, I want to know which routes they're going to be taking out. So if I have to try to go find them, I know where they're going to be. If you become trapped by heat and smoke, before you open any door, feel the door with the back of your hand before you open it. If we do have smoke coming through there, something you can do is you can stuff towels down under the door, around the cracks, something that can help keep that uh, barrier intact between you and the fire. Stay low, smoke rises. It's gonna rise until it catches at the ceiling and then it's gonna to start to build up and come down. So the lower that you stay, even if it's in an area where you don't see smoke necessarily, those gases, some of them are invisible, they can still take the, the breath out of our lungs. So, so stay down even if you don't see that smoke. If you're able to call 911, let that dispatcher know where you are, what room you're in, so that they can relay that information to us so that we can come get you. If you're unable to do that and you see us roll up, you can get our attention from the windows, right? If you still have power to your house, you can flick the, the uh, lights on and off to help get attention. That's something that we're gonna see before we even get out of the rig as we're coming down the street. If possible, open the window at, at the top or bottom, but do not break it. You might need to close the window to help keep that fire from coming to your location. Again, fire breathes. So if you give it an opening to find some air, it's gonna to wanna to come towards that opening. Cooking is the number one uh, cause of fires. Uh, through the National Fire Association, they're able to track the, these things, we report to them. Uh, the vast majority of fires uh, happen from in kitchens, from cooking, as I was just telling you guys about, I'm probably guilty of a little bit, right? Uh, if you leave the kitchen, uh, turn the burner off. Don't leave uh, flames unattended, right? Especially with, with children or pets. Uh, keep things that can burn away from the cooking area. A lot of things that we have in the kitchen contain a lot of natural oils and stuff, and those things can catch fire pretty easily. Uh, even bags of chips. We don't even talk about like uh, paper towels and stuff. Just other food products can catch fire pretty quickly. Turn the pot handles in so they don't get bumped. Electrical safety. Don't over loud outlets. So one of the things that we'll see a ton of is uh, people using extension cords interior for permanent use, right? Extension cords are, are meant to be a temporary thing. They're not meant to be uh, used as a long-term thing. We take uh, power from this side of the room and run it over here. We're overloading circuits that weren't designed to have that much energy traveling through them and that can cause us problems down the road. The other thing that we see is uh, people will use the surge protectors, the power strips, and they'll piggyback a couple of them together to get that little extra reach, right? Uh, those can overload those circuits too. We don't, we don't wanna do that. Uh, those cords can heat up and stuff too, especially if we leave them coiled up while we're using them. Uh, uh, Christmas time's a real bad one for this because of Christmas lights and stuff like that. If you don't need the full length of the cord, you know, they'll leave it kind of coiled up. Uh, those things, when they draw that energy, uh, can have that friction. It's kind of like water through a hose. Uh, it can cause that friction and causes it to heat up and can cause fires to happen that way. We don't want to use any faulty appliances. If you see it, we don't want to have that toaster that we got to bang a few times to get it to work, right? Let's just, let's just get a new toaster. It's a safer thing to do. And keep electricity away from water. Be fire smart with electricity. Extension cords are for temporary use, as I talked about, and have an uh, extension cord that is frayed or broken, discard it, it's not worth it. Don't do the old electrical tape method, right? If it got uh, nicked or something somehow, that probably caused some damage that we can't see, 
and get another one. Plug portable heaters directly into outlets. Uh, those cause a lot of draw. They take a lot of energy. They're going to cause a lot of friction through those temporary extension cords and stuff like that. Sometimes we'll use the really tiny extension cords uh, meant for smaller appliances, and we plug bigger things into them. Uh, I've even seen people take the, the grounding thing and, and bust it off of there. That way I can fit it in the two-prong hole, right? Uh, we don't want to do those things. Keep anything that can burn at least three feet away from fireplaces, wood stoves, portable heaters. This is another thing that we'll see a lot in the colder months. We're kind of coming out of those now, but candles, things too close to, to heaters, fireplaces, things like that, uh, it, it causes a, a bigger issue than one might think. Have your furnace or chimney uh, or the chimney connector expected by a professional. Uh, you should probably do that at least once a year, it says each each winter, well, you're probably going to want to use it in the winter. So maybe think about that a little bit before the winter so that you can have that thing serviced and ready to go. Uh, we burn wood. There's moisture inside wood. Even if we dry it out, some moisture can still be stuck in there. We burn that. It creates a creosote, like a real gummy substance that goes up inside the chimneys. And then that's just unburned products of combustion, right? So those that's fuel that starts to line your chimney. And then that gets hot enough, and that catches fire, and now we have a whole other problem. Smokers, always smoke outside, right? Uh, and be careful with what we do with those uh, discarded smoking materials. Uh, we'll see even ones that smoke outside, they'll go out and smoke on their back deck. They'll be flicking the ashes on their deck or whatever, maybe drop the, the butt. It goes down in between the little pieces of wood on the deck, and then a few hours later, the back deck's on fire. Never smoke in bed. It's a lot real easy to be laying down, be nice and comfortable, relaxed, fall asleep. Uh, put a glass of, put water on cigarettes before throwing them into the trash. Uh, this goes for fireworks and for like grilling outside, like uh, charcoal briquettes, anything like that. If you do that, make sure that we, we wet those down. Uh, or if you use a smoker, I use a smoker sometimes. Uh, wet that stuff down before we stick it in the, in the trash can. Sometimes we can think it's pretty dry. We can think it's out. We can touch it with our hand. It's nice and cold. We throw it away. A couple hours later, fire department's at your house. How to use a fire extinguisher. So we use the acronym PASS, pull, aim, squeeze, and sweep. So they have some type of a pin usually with them. We want to pull that pin. We're going to aim the nozzle towards the base of the fire. We're going to squeeze the handle, and we're going to sweep it back and forth. Now you should only be using fire extinguishers as a means for you to escape, right? If it's a small fire that can put it out, hey, that's, that's even better. But if you have to travel all the way across the house to get the smoke to the, the, the fire extinguisher and then come all the way back into the room that's on fire. Remember to the beginning, fire grows fast, smoke exponentially worse. Let it go. Sorry, Chief, I didn't know you had these nice pictograms in here. So the, the burn law, the 4 p.m. burn law. Uh, all throughout the state of Virginia. February 15th to April 30th, you can't do any burning during the day. It has to be after 4 p.m. at night. Uh, and it can't be within 300 foot of uh, woodlands, brush uh, areas, grassy areas. Uh, the major reason for this uh, the law went into effect is because this time of year uh, that's in there, you usually get some higher winds during the day. They kind of die down a little bit by the evenings. So that's why they traditionally put that law in there like that with those time frames so we can burn a little bit in the evenings. But those higher winds during the day are going to spread those uh, ashes and embers. And we have a lot, of, a lot of vegetation in this area, so it could cause some pretty big fires. Fires have to be attended at all times within 150 feet of uh, a woodland or dry area. No fuel added to the fire after midnight. And the law applies to campfires, warming fires, brush piles, household trash, dumps, pretty much anything that you're going to be doing with burning outside. It has a fine of $500, potentially. And if you see any type of fire, you're obviously going to want to call 911. But if you're going to do any type of a controlled fire, call the dispatch center, let them know. So that way, if somebody sees smoke in the area, calls 911, 
they don't just send us out there lights and sirens and trying to figure out why we're showing up when you're just trying to enjoy yourselves in the evening. Any questions for me over fire safety stuff? I hope I didn't uh, be too boring with that. <laughs> yes, sir. So for those of you at home, the gentleman uh, was commenting about if you have like a pile of leaves, are you taking care of your leaves during the day or anything, and you rake them out towards the front, uh, and you have your, par your car parked normally there, that, that exhaust system for your car, your catalytic converter, your muffler stays hot for quite a while, park uh, up over by those leaves, and they could catch fire and then catch your car on fire. So be careful of that as well. That's an excellent point, sir. Thank you very much. Any other comments, concerns, questions? Yes, ma'am. Uh huh. Is that recommended for apartments as well? Because I just moved into an apartment, and I'm just thinking about the fact that that's my only way out, basically, is to go through that door. So, so the question was, does the uh, comments about sleeping with your door closed in houses apply to apartments as well? And uh, the concern being, that's the only way out for her. Uh, I would absolutely 100% encourage that any door that you can close uh, during the night when you sleep, that you should close and have those smoke detectors in place as well so that it gives you that early notification and then uh, it slows that fire down before getting to you. So I would absolutely encourage that even though that's your only way out, it's going to be a, a protection and a, and a safe haven for you as well. Good question. Anything else? Chief Perriman, did you have anything you would like to add? Absolutely. Thank you. Um, I just want to say thank you for everyone joining us here tonight. Um, and again, I want to thank uh, or congratulate Ms. Laster for her award. And thank you to... Uh, Junior Perryman and Mr. Weeks for doing a great presentation. Um, again, this is for the community, and this is for our neighborhoods, and um, again, we're so happy that you know we can do this for you. Um, our next meeting um, will be uh, April 28th. Um, would be our back on our normal Thursday for our meeting. Um, the location is to be determined, um, but we will make sure everyone gets a notification of that. Um, and if there's nothing else, um, we will have uh, Master Police Officer Cole and Sergeant Caruso uh, come up with door prizes. And I just need to make an announcement that everyone get a ticket uh, for their door prizes. Everyone got a ticket? All right, thank you. Good evening. So we have two final announcements before we get to the funness of the door prizes. Um, just a reminder that we do still have some Grant Strong t-shirts and sweatshirts available for sale, as well as uh, these really cool nifty bracelets. I don't know if you can see mine. It's black and purple. T-shirts are $25.00. Sweatshirts are $35, bracelets are for donations. All proceeds go towards supporting MPO Grant in his fight against cancer. So please help him. We're all supporting him as well. And the second announcement is just a reminder that we are accepting nominations for our Amazing Citizen Award. As Chief Jenkins mentioned earlier tonight, these nominations do come from the community. You all know who is not receiving recognition for their wonderful works and acts of service to our community. We don't necessarily see them, so we rely on you to tell us who needs to be recognized so that we can show them appreciation for the wonderful things that they do for us. So if you have somebody who needs to be recognized or that you think should be recognized, please send either Chief Jenkins a letter or swing by the police department or 
you can uh, send us a message through social media, any of our platforms, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn. I think that's what we have so far. <laughs> we get so many. But on that note, I believe that covers the announcements and Sergeant Caruso is going to be my Vanna White for the door prizes. <laughs>